realized that, you know, when I was looking at this chapter, uh, there's a lot of individual little segments in it, and each of them has a lot of wisdom in them, and there are a lot of great observations I'm sure you guys have made about those. I'm going to try to do something a little different. I'm going to try to drive us from the beginning to the end and try to see if there's some kind of theme, an overarching theme with all these seemingly disparate little pieces. And, and that's what I saw when I looked at it. You see this, uh, he starts in chapter 11, he's talking about the, uh, his yoke is light, and then he woe to the towns, and then he talks, the, then there's the grain in the field, and then there's the withered hand, and there's the deaf mute guy, there's the house of the mighty man, there's the revilement of the spirit, trees and fruit, sign of Jonah, impure spirit, and then at the end, as if to just tack on some other random thing, my mothers and my brothers aren't really my mothers and my brothers. I'm like, what? <laughs> Did he just, wh where, where is he headed? I felt like I was getting whiplash trying to drive through this chapter. So I started looking at it, and I wanted us to, I'm, I'm going to revisit a couple things that we talked about in, in past weeks, and then I'm going to, I'm going to propose what the theme is, and, and then ask you to bear with me as I try to take us through it. Now, when, as we go down this road, I'm going to take some side paths, and the reason why I'm afraid of questions <laughs> is because and, and observations during that is because if I get too far off the road, I'm afraid I won't be able to get back on and get us to the end. But I'm hoping there'll be time at the end and also during our discussion to hear the observations you guys have made on, on a whole nother level with all these things and these, these wise words that he has. Um, first, I wanted to Remember, we were talking about John the Baptist, and we were saying, did he really have a crisis of faith? And we brought up the, the issue when he said, uh, are you the coming one? And we could just kind of breezed over it that um, in the Talmud, there's talk of, of two coming ones, that there's Messiah ben Yosef and Messiah ben David, suffering servant, and the king. And they were thinking, well, we have two messiahs here. You know, of course, then he flips that on his head, and we understand now it's not two messiahs, it's one messiah who comes twice. Yeah. And, and so I wanted to go back to the Talmud for just a second and show you that, what exactly they said, because I think it kind of plays into what's going on here. Keep in mind, <coughs> John the Baptist is, is in prison now. Mm -hmm. And I think John the Baptist is very much in the forefront of Yeshua's mind as, as he starts this theme here in these events and these words that, that he says. So in the, in the Talmud, Tractate Sanhedrin 98, okay, you have Rabbi Yohanan who says, the son of David will come only to a generation that is either altogether righteous or altogether wicked. Now, having read the chapter, we know how he's characterizing this generation, altogether wicked. And you think, was that generation really the most wicked? I mean, we've seen Hitler, we've seen some awful things. How wicked were they? I think he's going to clue us into that a little bit. Um, Rabbi uh, Joshua says, if they, the generation, are meritorious, he will come with the clouds of heaven. If not, he will come lowly and riding upon a donkey. Keep in mind, this is, they, the scholars in his day are familiar with this. When he rides into town on a donkey, it is the most condemned. I mean, we, on the surface, we see our humble Savior riding in on a donkey. Yes, there is that, but there's subtext. Mm -hmm. There's a condemnation to those scholars. By riding in on a donkey, he's saying, you are not worthy of me. Okay, there was this, as, as I was looking at this, this, this keeps going through my head, something greater than the temple is here. Um, and I, I started thinking, this is, this is almost like a trial. This is a condemnation of a generation. This is a generation on trial here. And we're going to see what they've done and what they've said uh, that is particularly bad. Um, I wanted to, the, the, the trial thing, let me, this is how I got there. I wrote out the whole chapter. I'm seeing these kinds of things. I'm seeing condemn the innocent, 
in order to find wrongful words to hold against him. Bring forth everlasting judgment. Let me skip bind loose for just a second. Give an account for your words on the day of judgment. By your words you will you'll be justified. Liable. And I'm thinking, this sounds like a court. This bind loose thing, I know that because of our modern culture, we hear bind loose and we immediately go to the exorcism thing. But that bind loose was an, a common expression in Jewish legal phraseolo phraseology. And it meant to declare something forbidden or declare it aloud. So I want us, when we hear the, the phrase bind loose, don't go straight to demons. Mm -hmm. Back up, use your wide angle lens a little bit, and remember forbidden, to declare it forbidden, to declare it to be allowed. Um, I, I wanted to think of a little picture of what was going on here. And I, I, I'm, this is what I'm imagining. I'm imagining that, let, let's say there's a, there's a professor of Shakespeare on trial for some heinous acts. And he's very smart. He doesn't think anyone could have possibly figured out what he did. And um, he, he is, he's, he's an expert in Shakespeare. He knows all the references. He knows all the little stories and the, the little, the, the underlying things and, and the words that are used. And, and then you have this prosecutor. Well, this prosecutor knows Shakespeare even better. <laughs> This prosecutor, for all intents and purposes, is Shakespeare, let's say. Mm -hmm. And he's also able to read the mind of the professor. He knows what he's done exactly. He knows exactly what his motives were for doing it. Now, mind reading can't be used as evidence in a court. But this prosecutor, in delivering his indictment of this guy, let's say he uses Shakespeare in references and language that will let that professor know, I know exactly what went on. I know exactly what happened. I know exactly what you were thinking, and I know what you're thinking right now. And this, this guy on trial, all of a sudden, he feels exposed because he knows. This guy knows exactly what's going on. And I think that when we look at Yeshua, there, yes, there are these Torah scholars, and they know Torah like better than anybody else. But here you have Yeshua. He doesn't just know Torah, he is Torah. And I think that he knows what's in their hearts. He says he knows what's in their hearts. He knows what they've done. He knows what they're going to do. And I think he's using language in chapter 12, using subtle little references because he, he'll use a phrase. And these Torah scholars are good. They can hear a phrase or a set of words and they know where in the Torah that is, and they know the context. They know what's all around it. And I think that maybe he's using subtext to really dig an elbow into these guys as he delivers this condemnation of them and the generation. Um, of course, okay, I want to go back to... Uh, chapter 11, because when I was reading chapter 12, I kept thinking, I backed up to chapter 11, I'm feeling like this might be his opening statement. He uses some words here, and I wrote them down, because I want us to remember, I wanted to, we're going to put them in our pocket, and we're going to get them out as we go through chapter 12, as, as he, I think he's addressing some of these things. Uh, Matthew eleven sixteen 16 through 20, he asked the question, to whom will I compare this generation? And I think that's our overarching question. Remember that question as we go through here. To whom will we compare this generation? And he says, it's like children in the market, played flutes, you didn't dance. He says, Yohanan came, he was not eating or drinking, and they said, there is a demon in him. I want you to remember that. I wrote it down. The son of man came eating and drinking. They said, look, a man who is a glutton and a drunkard. Remember those words, that language. But wisdom is justified by her sons. He says, I think this is going to, when we're, we're, there's almost this comparison. I know in Matthew, it seems like there's all these menorah comparisons. You've got mirror images, you've got pairs and stuff like that going on. And I felt like 
that was the middle of our menorah. Wisdom is justified by her deeds. Okay? And then we're going to see these contrasts now, these comparisons between different things. Um, after this, he begins to rebuke the towns for their unresponsiveness. It says, even Sodom and Gomorrah, if they'd been exposed to the light you guys are exposed to, would have responded differently. So they're being held accountable for the amount of light that they're not responding to. They have the truth, the obvious truth in front of them. And we're going to see this later. Nicodemus admits it. It's obvious by what you do, who you are, that you're sent by God. And they, don't, and they respond with rebellion. And a few verses later, he says, for my, he, he switches to the yoke, and he says, my yoke is pleasant and my burden is light. And the reason why I stuck that in there is there's this little piece that comes in later with this light burden that I just, I, it was just one of those things that kind of tickled me. So we're going to maybe see that <clears throat> just come up in, in kind of a, almost a frosting sort of way later on. <clears throat> Let's talk about that demon that they say is in Yohanan, John the Baptist. <clears throat> okay, is it impure or holy? They said it was impure. They're saying this about the Holy Spirit. If you look back at Luke, it says he was filled with the Holy Spirit from his mother's belly. He had the Holy Spirit, okay? So sp what they're saying about the Spirit in him is that it's impure. Now, about Yeshua, he says, a glutton and drunkard. He, do you remember those words from the Old Testament? Glutton and drunkard? It's in there. I looked it up. <laughs> it's in the law of the rebellious son. If you look at Deuteronomy, it says, if a man is, it has a stubborn and rebellious son who will not listen to his father's voice. Yeshua's saying, you're calling me the rebellious son. Okay. They would take him to the elders at the gate of the city. They would say, he's a glutton and a drunkard. He shall die. So you shall put away evil from among you that all Israel shall hear and fear. Okay. Let's dive into Matthew. Okay. At that time, he passed through the standing grain his disciples were hungry. They plucked the grain and ate. The Pharisees said, Look, your disciples are doing what's not to be done on the Sabbath. He said to them, Have you not read what David did? Okay, tell you something greater than the temple is here. I wanted to highlight some things in here. I know we've read through this already. I didn't want to read it word for word again. Um, when they say, Look, your disciples are doing what's not to be done. Okay. <clears throat> Remember last time he said, go find out what it means. I have desired kindness and not sacrifice. He said this before in Matthew. And they weren't accusing them of doing something wrong. They were just asking a question. That was almost an accusation, but it was a question. Was, hey, are you guys doing this right? Can you believe this? Now they're flat out accusing. They've gone over the line now. And uh, remember... When, I, when he says, I desire kindness, not sacrifice, we discussed that. Kindness, I desire steadfast loyalty, not outward acts. So even on here, where'd it go? Over there. <laughs> steadfast loyalty, outward acts. Okay. So now they've condemned the innocent. Okay, to whom will he compare this generation? Let's look at how two different generations respond to their deliverer. Which generation are we going to go to to compare this one? Well, very, the very next thing that happens in Matthew is he goes to the synagogue. Uh, he sees the guy with a withered hand, and he says this. Is there a person among you with a sheep that if it were to fall into a cistern, a sheep in a cistern? Do you know of anyone who is in a well, thrown into a well? Isn't that how, isn't that how is, or they, the nation got down into Egypt? Threw their brother in the well, and the brother ended up down, in, okay. He says to the man, stretch out your hand. 
He stretched it out. His hand was healed and returned. Then the Pharisees left and deliberated. Here's our court again. Deliberated how to destroy him. Okay, so let's keep these, these phrases in mind. We've got a hand that's withered. By the way, it was his right hand. If you look at another gospel, there's a little more detail about it. And in, in you know, Jewish thinking, your left is physical, your right is spiritual. Do not let your left hand know what your right is doing. Don't let your physical know what, you, you know, do this with the, the, the spirit. And you, you can kind of keep that theme in mind when it refers to a hand as right or, which says something as right or left. Just kind of keep it back there somewhere. So his right hand is withered, spiritually withered, this generation. Okay. This sheep that falls into a cistern is bringing me back to Egypt. The stretch out the hand is even more reinforcing that Egypt idea because we hear that back. We're going to go back to Egypt in just a second on our little journey. Okay, hand healed and returned. <coughs> Let's remember that and go back to Egypt. Now, Moses is asked to go and deliver his people and he says, they won't believe me. They won't listen to my voice. It's funny because this generation isn't really listening to Moses' voice either. Okay? So he says, what's that in your hand? He says, a staff. He throws it on the ground. It becomes a snake. Moses flees. He says to Moses, stretch out your hand. Take it by the tail. So he does, and it turns back into a staff. Now stretch out your hand, that, that phrase, you'll see it a lot. It has to do with power. Um, the second sign he gives them to show the elders of Israel so that they'll believe Moses is there to free them is put your hand to your bosom. And he put it in there and he brought it out and his hand was leprous like snow. He said put it back in there. And he brought it out and it was returned. Healed. He says, he says something that I thought was a little odd. If they will not believe you and will not listen to the voice of the first sign, the voice of the first sign, could these signs be representing something in the future that would have a voice? Maybe. I don't know. Let's look at staff snake. When you think staff, think shepherd. When you think snake, think sin. You have a staff thrown to the ground, the shepherd thrown to the ground, turned into sin, and restored. Okay, your second sign is this leprous hand. Now, when Miriam got leprosy, it gave us a clue as to what leprosy was, was a punishment for, and that was slander. And there's a lot of that going on here in, in, this, in the time of this evil generation. So you've got this punishment for slander, they also thought leprous of leprous as death. In fact, when Moses is pleading with God to, to take care of Miriam, he says, I beg you, do not let her be as one dead. So you've got this hand that's like snow. Well, we know, we know from, you know, Psalms and white as snow and this purge me with hyssop, I shall be clean, wash me, I shall be white as snow. Okay, we, we know that that's, we're looking at Messiah here. So, in both of these cases, you have restoration. You have the staff restored to being a staff, and you have the hand restored to being a hand. The staff is thrown to the ground and restored. The hand is brought to the bosom and restored. Um, how did this generation respond to their deliverer? When Moses went to them and he did all these signs for them, what did they do? When he, when he did his signs, they believed, the people believed, and they bowed and they worshipped. Okay. That was a good response. Okay. Just as a little side note before we leave here, I want you to see this. <clears throat> now those, those first and third signs that he did for the elders, those, those were... Uh, he did those for Pharaoh, too. He did the snakes, and the, you know the snakes, and they eat each other. The magicians did it, too. They copied it. He did the, the, the water into blood, too, and they, they copied it. And when he gets to the third plague, they can't copy it. 
It's the dust of the earth plague. It turns the dust into gnats. They can't copy it. And the magicians, when they couldn't copy it, said to Pharaoh, this is the finger of God. That phrase is not used a lot. Okay? Remember that. Just for a second. <laughs> the fakes who were copying for a while, until they couldn't anymore, when they realized this is genuine, said that. All right. Yeshua knew that they were, we're back to Matthew. Gone back on the road now. Yeshua knew they were deliberating against him. He departed from there. Crowd follows him. He heals them. <clears throat> he warns them not to reveal him. Fulfilling what Isaiah the prophet said. And, you know, when, when I'm seeing this, he will not cry out. He will not raise his voice, nor will it be heard in the street. It's like, here, it's not that he wasn't speaking truth in front of people. I think it's just that he wasn't, wasn't really doing it like WikiLeaks style. He was doing it more like, I know, and you know I know what's up with you, and what's wrong with you. But you know, he's not, he's not there to bring peace. He's there to divide, and I think that's what we have. He's dividing the good from the bad. He was doing undercover balls. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Okay, then a man's brought to him who's blind and mute, whom a demon had gripped. Let me make sure I'm in the right place with my notes here. Hang on, I'm behind. Okay, and he healed him, and the mute could both speak and see, and the entire crowd of people was amazed, and they said, could this be the son of David? And the Pharisees heard this, <gasps> and they said, he doesn't drive away demons except through Beelzebub. The prince of demons, but Yeshua knew their thoughts, and he said to them, Every kingdom divided against itself will not stand. Drive out, drive out demons by Beelzebub. Whom do, by whom do your sons drive them out? I want to take this in a little, little smaller chunks, but I wanted to ask you a qu question first. Not, you know, not to like deliberate, but just think about. It. Especially given this last week, is how many, t how often does the accuser accuse somebody of the very thing they're guilty of? Yeah. We see that a lot, right? Okay. What did they accuse him of? Driving out demons by Beelzebub. Okay, let's take this in small chunks. He says, every kingdom divided against itself will be destroyed. The kingdom divided. Okay, let's think about it. We've got some king, kingdom divided. Well, there's back in when he, Nebuchadnezzar's Babylonian thing, at the end of that, he says your kingdom's divided, and then the Medes and the Persians come in and take over. But more prevalent in the entire Bible is a different kingdom that got divided. Israel, north and south. It's a kingdom divided. Okay. If Satan drives out Satan, he's divided against himself. Then how would his kingdom remain firm? Well, do you think Satan is divided against himself or not? Is his kingdom going to stand? Isn't he kind of about division anyway? So let's not just assume that he wouldn't operate that way. He says, if I drive out demons by Beelzebub, by whom do your sons drive them out? Well, that's a good question. I would still like to know the answer. By whom do they drive them out? Let's just think about that later. Maybe we'll each come up with a, our own assumption. Therefore, they will be your judges. Who will be their judges? Who do you think he's talking about here? Does he mean that their sons will be their judges? I don't know, but somebody will. Reminder that wisdom is justified by her sons or her deeds. So, maybe it works the other way, too. Now, it doesn't have it. This is the same event <clears throat> in a different gospel, and it doesn't contain it in Matthew. But right after he says this, in Matthew, he says, But if by the finger of God I drive out demons. Okay, there's finger of God again. And I'm not sure it's anywhere else but those two places. So is he... 
Are they, are they, are they these fakes? Okay, so I think a little further in we might look at the implications of whether or not they're, they, these guys are frauds, if he's calling them frauds, and, and what happens if you're sending away impure spirits as a fraud, <coughs> what the implications are that for the entire generation and possibly even the temple. Um, let's take this next little chunk because this one I had a certain idea in my mind and then I had to kind of flip that around and think about it a different way. He says, how can, a, how can a man enter the house of a mighty man to steal his goods if he does not first bind the mighty man? Afterward he can come up against his house. Everyone who's not for me is against me and whoever does not gather with me scatters. Mighty man, is he good or bad? I always thought the mighty man was bad because he's being bound like a demon would be bound, because I'm thinking exorcism when I see the word bind. But the mighty man isn't the bad guy, the thief is the bad guy. Someone's coming to steal his stuff. How can he steal his goods if he does not first forbid the mighty man? Okay, afterward, he can come up against his house. So who's the mightiest man, and what is his house? Could there be some allusion to the temple here? I don't know, but maybe, maybe further on in, they'll be, they'll, it'll look like there's a connection there. Okay, and then whoever's not with me scatters. Um, okay, then he switches to the revilement of the spirit. He says, therefore I say to you, every sinner offensive word will be forgiven a person, but revilement of the spirit won't be forgiven. Now, they have said now that Yohanan had an impure spirit. That was revilement because we know that he had the Holy Spirit. And they say, same event, if you look at Mark, Mark 3.30, they said, he, he's saying this, for they said he had a spirit of impurity in him. So now they're saying that Yeshua has this spirit of impurity too. And we know that that's the Holy Spirit. So they've done it twice now, with Yohanan and with Yeshua. They've reviled the spirit twice. Okay. And I wanted to call your attention to this for just a second. And then he switches. He says, call the tree good and its fruit good, for the tree is recognized by its fruit. Okay. And, and this is where I started thinking maybe he has, maybe Johannan, John the Baptist, is more in the forefront of his mind right now than, than I had considered before. Um, back, in, in, back in Luke, John the Baptist says, some stuff about trees too. He's a little harsher about it. He says, the ax has already been placed at the root. Every tree that does not produce good fruit will be chopped down and thrown to the fire. That's some pretty condemning stuff. You see what he said right there? Before he said the tree thing? How he introduced this? Here's the tree thing. He says, you children of vipers. Okay, just in case you thought, you know, that, that there might not be a connection here between John and Yeshua. Here's Yeshua saying, in the verse we just looked at, the tree is recognized by its fruit. Do you know what the very next thing he says is? Sons of vipers. So John said, sons of vipers, tree. He says, tree, sons of vipers. Okay. How would you be able to speak good? Overflow of your heart. He knows what's in their heart. Okay. An evil man from the storehouse of evil brings forth evil. By your words you will be justified. By your words you will become liable. And it's interesting that when we see that saying wisdom is justified by her deeds, in many translations it says wisdom is justified. Or when we see sons, it's also deeds. So it sounds like what you produce if you try to look at some connection between sons and deeds. Um, I wanted to, since since he just may have John the Baptist in mind. I did too. I had John the Baptist in mind, um, feeling really bad for him. And I was thinking about that uh, zeal for the Father's house. And we're going to take a little detour right now. We're going to go sightseeing through the Psalms. This is Psalm 69. This is just verses 4 
through 12. And I, I highlighted some words here I want you to just put in your pocket. Um, Those who hate me without cause are more than the hairs of my head. Okay, and just a little earlier in Matthew, is, he referred to hairs of your head in a good way. Okay, now this is the enemies are more than the hairs of my head. Those who would destroy me are more are <coughs> powerful. What I did not steal, I then have to restore. Okay. Oh God, it is thou who dost know my folly and my wrongs are not hidden from me. May those who wait for thee not be ashamed through me. Does that echo of anything we just talked about? Those who wait for thee not to be ashamed through me. It almost reminds me of what he, the last thing he said to John was don't be offended. You're going to be there in prison, but don't be offended by this. Um, he says, because for thy sake I have borne reproach, dishonor has covered my face. I have become estranged from my brothers, an alien to my mother's sons, for zeal for thy house has consumed me. That This is the one that they were thinking of when he did that in the temple, when he drove out the money changers. And the reproaches of those who reproach thee have fallen on me. When I wept in my soul with fasting, I became my, it became my reproach. When I made sackcloth my clothing, again, I'm thinking of poor John, I became a byword to them. Those who sit at the gate talk about me, and I am the song of drunkards. And you remember, it was a rebellious son who was brought to the gate, called a drunkard, a glutton, and a drunkard. That incident in the temple, um, he, he takes cords, gets a whip, he scatters the coins of the money changers, overturns their tables. Um, do not make my father's house into a marketplace, he says. And um, this is his first reference to that Jonah, the three-day Jonah thing. This is the first time it kind of, he doesn't, he doesn't say anything about Jonah, but he makes this allusion to it. He says, tear down this sanctuary, and in three days I will rise it up, raise it up. Okay, that's kind of his first, our first introduction to the Jonah thing. After this in John, is when, right after this, Nicodemus comes to him. This is when Nicodemus says, we know who you are, we can tell you are, but what you do, that you're from God. Okay, it's obvious. And then he has the conversation with Nicodemus, the born of water, born of the spirit, and Nicodemus is confused about being born again and, and all that. And then he says this thing at the end of his conversation with Nicodemus, he says, just as Moshe elevated the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Remember that, back in Numbers? And they had to put the snake up on the, the pole. Okay. This was a, uh, why did they have to do that? What did they do that the snakes came out and started biting them? The people spoke against God and against Moses. They said, you've brought us out here to die. There's no bread. There's no water. They said this thing, and that I just noticed this time, was our soul hates the light bread. The light bread. I never noticed that before. They said, our soul hates the light bread. His burden is light, yet they hate it. Okay, and so uh, Yahweh yeah, tells him to make a serpent out of copper and put it up on a pole. And so if they're bitten by a snake, they look at the serpent, the copper serpent up on the pole, and then they're healed. Okay. Um, and that, that, and this is a total side trip from a side trip that we were on. <laughs> Sorry, we'll get back on the road in a minute. But right here, I've got. Uh, I noticed something weird. Was that here's your word for? And this is the paleo, and this is the regular Hebrew. This is the word for serpent. Okay, you've got the the nun, which is like a offspring. Well, obviously, you can tell by the paleo what it is. Uh, then you have the, the het, which is like a divider, and, uh, a, like a protection or a fence, yeah. And then you have the shin, which is, uh, you think of your two front teeth, biting something, cut in half, dividing. Okay, so that's the word for serpent. But when you look at the meaning of serpent, you find that one of the meanings is the shining one. The shining one. Snakes aren't shiny. And if you, if you take that back to Genesis, and you think, instead of the serpent in the garden, the shining one in the garden, 
was it actually a snake? I don't know. Let's you know, we don't have to we don't have to debate that. But isn't that interesting? That it's shining one. Now in in the Chaldean, they use the same word for copper because it's shiny. The Hebrew, however, adds a letter. The top. Okay. The mark, the covenant, the cross. So they're looking at the shining one of a covenant for healing. So I would love for somebody to do a big study on snakes and the different words used for snake and where that happens and all that <coughs> snake stuff. But that's as far as we're going with that. So back to, to whom will we compare this generation? Okay. Here's, here he's going to condemn them. So men from the scholars and, the, and the, the smart guys and the Pharisees, they answered him and they said, Rabbi, we desire to see a sign by your hand. And he answers with this. And I wanted to pull out a couple things there. We desire to see a sign from your hand. And he says, evil, adulterous generation seeks for a sign. Now, I don't think he's saying that because they sought for a sign that that makes them evil and adulterous. <laughs> and in fact, in one of the other Gospels, he says it a little differently. He says that you're an evil and adulterous generation, period. You seek for a sign. And I think he's just saying, all right, the evil and adulterous generation wants to see their sign. He says, you aren't getting one except for Jonah the prophet. Okay? And I think that has become very important, especially in... Hebrew roots, that whole three days, three nights thing, that dilemma, I think, is bringing a lot of people out of the tradition. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I think that sign has implications across time. Okay, so this just as Jonah was in the heart of the fish, uh, so will the Son of Man be in the heart of the ground. And then, he's, then he brings in Nineveh, because that's where Jonah was headed, telling them to repent. He said, something greater, but something greater than Yonah is here. And then he brings in the Queen of the South. And she says that she will stand in judgment of this generation. She went from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. Yet something greater than Solomon is here. Now, this evil and adulterous right next to each other in close proximity does happen somewhere else in the Bible. It could happen in a couple places, but I know of one place where it happens. And just in case you had trouble remembering where, it gives you this clue right there. It's in Proverbs, the wisdom of Solomon. In the wisdom of Solomon, Proverbs 6, you're going to take a couple little chunks here. He says, the commandment is a lamp, the Torah is a light, reproofs for discipline are the way of life, to keep you from the evil woman, from the smooth tongue of the adulteress. Do not desire her beauty in your heart, nor let her catch you with her eyelids. For on account of the harlot, one is reduced to a loaf of bread. And this little echo in my head said, and he took the bread and broke it. Take it, eat it, this is my body. And an adulteress hunts for the precious life. Then he talks about this thief. Men do not despise a thief if he steals to satisfy himself, but when he's found, he must repay. Put this in your pocket for a minute later. Sevenfold. He must give all the substance of his house. Okay, so that was a question you can deliberate in your own mind. Who here has the impure spirit, and by whom do their sons, the Pharisees' sons, drive them out? He's going to talk about the impure spirit now. He says, after leaving a person, it wanders through dry places. Then it says, I will return to my home from where I left, and it comes to find it cleared, swept, and decorated. And just then I thought, after he went into the temple and he knocked over all their tables and made a big mess, what do you think they did? Do you think they all picked up their stuff and left? No, they cleaned it up. And they kept on, business as usual. Um, that says, afterward it goes out, it takes with it seven other spirits, more evil than itself, and they come to live there. And the end of that man is worse than his beginning. So it will also be for this evil generation. Remember, the thief in Proverbs must repay sevenfold. He must give all the substance of his house. And we know what happens to that house within a few decades. 
All right, we are nearing the end of our journey. That random thing he says at the end. Well, he's still speaking. His mother and his brothers are standing outside, and I want to talk to him. And he answers, and he says, who is my mother, and who are my brothers? I guess he lost his mind. Remember in that zeal for my house psalm, he said, I have become estranged from my brothers and an alien to my mothers. The reproaches of those who reproach thee have fallen on me. And then he says, as if just to bookend the whole thing, or he does, he doesn't say it, he does it, he stretches out his hand over his disciples. And he says, here are my mothers and my brothers. For anyone who does the will of the Father in heaven is a brother, sister, and a mother to me. Wisdom being justified by her sons. And the question is, what can our own generation learn from this? And that's all I have. <laughs> Some of the things that I talked about here, you'll see them placed opposite each other. Like the, on the outside, you have the responsive generation. And then on, uh, the, and on the other hand, you have the evil, and I should have said right and left. Hey, I did it right. The left is <laughs> bad. Right is good. Okay. The evil and adulterous generation. You have the Holy Spirit contrasted with the impure spirit. I'm working my way in. You have repentance contrasted with rebellion. The elevated serpent contrasted with the sons of vipers. The born of water and spirit contrasted with the demons wandering dry places. And the scattering of the money changers contrasted with those who scatter his sheep. And that now really is all I've got, guys. Very good. So. Thank you.